we are now moving into our third portion of memory in that we are going to be looking at now how it is that we go about pulling up information that has been encoded and stored. So memory retrieval is just when we can get information out, okay, from specifically from our memory storage in our long-term storage uh, specifically, okay? It's there. We know that it's there, but the question we've got to ask ourselves is how uh, is it possible for us to get that out and use it when we need it, okay? And there's multiple different retrieval cues that can be used, and so that's what we're going to spend a good portion of this set of notes discussing. Retrieval cues are stimuli that help us to get information out of our long-term memory, okay? Uh, so think of these like search items when you type in something into Google, okay? When you're using an internet search engine, it uses those as clues basically to help it sort through all of the entries, all of the pieces of information that have been stored in that search engine to find the right one that you would prefer. So it's a good way to think of it in that regard. There are multiple different kinds of retrieval cues out there. Um, we have mnemonic devices, for example. Right here, this is our example for method of loci. And right here is our peg word example. Okay, so memories are helped uh, by being able to use various different cues to retrieve that information, okay? They're held kind of in just all of these various different networks in our brain. And so we use associations to be able to pull those memories out. So let's use this one for example. It's been several days since I went through the video notes with you for memory encoding, and we talked about the concept of method of loci. However, and you can test me on this and go back and check and make sure I'm right, I know that the first item on that list that I was trying to remember when I established it as the method of loci was textbook. Because when I went back and I went through all that to show you guys how it would be easy for us to be able to remember a list of items, the thing that I told you guys about was that you, for example, fell asleep reading through your textbook because it is your best friend and you spend lots and lots of time with it. So purely because of that, even though there's been a long period of time uh, since my discussion of that and, and you know p sorting through that information it was easy for me to retrieve it and pull it up. Likewise with this uh, peg word scenario where you you know try to find a word that um, can help you to visualize the objects or lists that you're trying to come up with or jingles or something along those lines. We have one is bun, two is shoe. And so I could tell you, without having gone back to look at those video notes, that one is bun. The first item on that list was lettuce, because I pictured a bun and it had lettuce in between it. Two, the second item on my list was a banana. And I know that because I visualized, using peg words, a banana sitting in a pair of loafers. Okay, and so these are means in which we can use to help us pull memory up, okay? But it's important to note that retrieval cues themselves are only as good as the memory that you have encoded and stored, okay? So retrieval is going to depend on how much we were paying attention when the information was given, how well it was stored, things along those lines, okay? So if information wasn't properly encoded and stored, it's not going to be very easily retrieved, if done at all, okay? With this in mind, then let's talk about types of retrieval methods out there. One is recognition, okay? So in recognition, a person has to identify something um, while it is coupled and grouped with other things, okay? So when you guys have to answer multiple choice questions, it requires recognition because you have to pick out the proper answer from the four total that are presented to you. So we'll give you an example here. Name the capital of France. I'll give you a second. Think about it. Hopefully, you would recognize that it is Paris. And notice I said the word recognize. Because in recall, on the other hand, this is where you have to pull up the information using effort. Okay, so I'm going to back this up real fast. In recognition, we're not needing to fully have to come up with the answer because we can identify it. We know in a multiple choice question, for example, that the correct answer is there already. 
In recall, however, it requires more effort from you. So fill in the blank tests require recall because you have to sort through lots of information to be able to truly determine what the correct answer happens to be. So we'll do the capitals scenario again. The capital of Germany is what? This would require a little bit more thought from some of you, okay? And that answer is Berlin. So these are two different kinds of scenarios. Recognition means that you can pick it out from a group of items, so it's already there. Uh, but recall, it's very different, okay, because it requires much more effort. Now, relearning is also a retrieval cue. We're going to spend a large amount of time in third quarter into the very tail beginning of fourth quarter reviewing concepts to better prepare you to take that AP exam on May 6th, okay? Now the thing is, once you've learned something first and gone through it that initial stage and we're carrying out LTP and establishing our neural networks, the second time around, LTP has been established, okay? So the synapses in neurons will fire more quickly and you'll be able to carry things out more efficiently. And that goes for learning content as well. So in relearning, this shows just how much effort is saved the second time around because it should be less effort the second time around to review content than when it was involved in initially learning that information. So let's say it took 10 trials on this first list, uh, you know, this first portion of list to learn all of the items that were on it, okay? And then a day later, it only took five trials to learn that list, okay, to be able to remember it again and recite it back. So the saving in a scenario of relearning is this. You take the original number of trials and the relearning trials, you subtract that, then you divide it, and then you multiply it by 100. And so at the end of the day, we end up knowing that 50% of uh, the amount of time was saved through relearning. Okay, so relearning is a retrieval cue as well. Now, priming is an interesting retrieval cue because it provides us some kind of clue or indication that will stimulate a memory without our awareness of its connection to the retrieved memory. Okay, so we don't know necessarily why it is that we're retrieving a cue or we re we're receiving a cue and, you know, the memory that we're attempting to pull up. So this happens with you guys in, in my lectures and, uh, you know, in class discussions quite frequently. I'll prompt you or prime you with asking you about a particular experience and I'll ask you to therefore recall that memory. And many of you guys will sit there and say, I don't understand the connection between it. And then we will attempt in some manner to bring that and the piece of content we're covering together to connect them. So priming is oftentimes referred to as memory, memoryless memory, excuse me, because it, it's happening without our conscious awareness. So priming is kind of, you know, in, in a process we're just not effortfully attempting to get involved in. So priming predisposes us to recall information in a certain manner. Okay, so if I were to ask you to um, recall a specific memory that is particularly emotional for you, that's going to predispose you toward interpreting and informing uh, or gathering information in a certain manner. Context effects matter as well when it comes to our ability to pull information back up. Interestingly enough, if you put yourself back into the context, okay, the environment or the setting where you first experienced something, you can actually have a higher rate of memory retention and retrieval. Okay, so for example, scuba divers, uh, they were put underwater and they went under and they were asked to memorize a list of words while they were underwater in their scuba suits. Later, when they were put down in that same exact setting, they were able to recall more words than they did when they were on land. And likewise, when they learned words on land, they were more able to remember and recall the words when they were on land. Okay, so if that's the case, then how should you be studying for AP Psych? In what context? If you think about it, you're not taking your test at home. You're not taking it in your bedroom or in your parents' den where you're probably watching these video notes as we speak. You're taking it in class. 
So your best way to make sure that you can properly retrieve information that's been encoded and stored, pay attention during class. Because when you're in that context and in that setting, you'll be able to more easily recall the information when it comes to test time, purely because you're back in that scene, okay? You're in that setting. So at the bottom line in all of this is that the more closely a retrieval cue matches the form that the information was encoded in, the better the information is going to be remembered, okay? The more likely we'll be able to pull it up and retrieve it. Something to discuss with regard to memory retrieval as well is the concept of deja vu. Um, deja vu often is you know, discussed in terms of altered states of consciousness, okay, because sometimes it just kind of happens automatically, we don't realize it, and it just kind of hits us like, oh gosh, and it's that weird, creepy feeling like, I've been in this situation before, but in actuality, we know we haven't. The way that deja vu works is because cues from the current situation we find ourselves in, the context. So, let's say, for example, that um, your mom is asking you to go do your chores after she's given you a lecture about your grades, okay? And you find that you are just really agitated in the aftermath of that. You go upstairs, you try to cool off, calm yourself down. You get on Twitter and you start seeing that there's a bunch of people that are um, bad mouthing a friend of yours or they're talking smack about something. And you find yourself getting agitated again. And then, oh, just like that, you remember that your mom asked you to do some chores. That's state-dependent memory because you are back in the mood or emotional state when that information was originally encoded and set, okay? So another example, if you're mad when you learn information, you'll be more likely to remember that information uh, if you're mad, again, let's say when you're, you know, taking a test, okay? If you're learning about AP content, for cognition and you're seriously PO'd, make yourself really PO'd for the test day because you'll be more likely to remember that content on that day. Now, mood congruent memory is slightly different because it deals more so with the here and now, okay, the current scenario. This is when we have a tendency to recall our experiences that are consistent with the mood that we are currently in. Okay, so at the end of the day, all this means is that our emotions serve as retrieval cues. If you're happy and you're in a good mood, you're more likely to remember happy or positive, wonderful things that have happened to you, okay? If you're in a bad mood, that's gonna pull up a lot of sad and negative memories for you as well. So this is mood congruent scenario. So in our situation of state dependent memory, it still deals with mood, but it involves a little bit more time between the moods themselves. Mood congruent memory, on the other hand, is a little bit more involved in the current here and now experience. One more thing to talk about for retrieval cues is something called the tip of the tongue phenomenon. This is when we have that annoying situation where we can't recall a word or an idea or a person, but we know it, we recognize that it's in our memory and we know who the person is, we just can't say, their name, or we just can't say what that word is or that idea happens to be, okay? The most common items within tip of the tongue are, you know, names or familiar objects, okay? So if I were to ask you the name of the two actors in 21 Jump Street, you know, and you're, you're sitting there and you know who it is and you recognize it and you sit there and you say to yourself, oh, I know who the jock is, he's in a lot of chick flick movies, and he was in that movie Magic Mike, but I just can't remember what his name is. That's the tip of the tongue phenomenon. So you know that it's stored there in your memory. You just can't get to that point where you can remember that it's Channing Tatum's name, okay? The reason why this happens, we think, is because of some level of interference that occurred during recall. You just had a poor match between the you just had a poor match between the retrieval cue. So another situation of so another situation of the tip of the tongue phenomenon could be. Uh, naming all seven of the dwarves. Most of us know that they, you know, they're kind of um, states of being or emotional states with the exception of one, and that is Doc. Okay, so dopey, sleepy, sneezy, happy, grumpy, bashful, and Doc. Those are the seven. For many of you, maybe you were just struggling, you're just like, oh. So this is the end of the memory retrieval notes. Let me know if you have any questions.